Yes, my name is Naomi Namakata, and I'm an assistive technology specialist with the Washington Assistive Technology Program. We refer to it as WATAB. And today you are here for a one hour webinar on what's new with AT for vision loss. So to get started, I do want to share uh, about some of the services we have available at WATAP. Our mission is to provide all Washingtonians with guidance, resources, expertise around assistive technology. We really want to help individuals make informed choices uh, around purchase and procurement of assistive technology. So uh, we have a number of um, services that are free or low cost to individuals, which I will talk about in a second. Um, but each state does have a mandated assistive technology program. Uh, in our state, we are housed at the University of Washington Center for Technology and Disability Studies. This is our WATAP team. As you can see, we're quite small. Um, Alan Canoe is our director, myself, Kurt Johnson, and Maria Kelly, our assistive technology specialists, and Scott Kanan manages our lending program amongst lots of other tasks. The best way to learn more about our program is to find us online. Our website is watap.org. Some of the services that we have available are to borrow a device from our lending program. We have hundreds, if not thousands of devices um, that individuals can borrow. And really the goal is to try the equipment um, in their own environment before making a decision around purchasing. Um, we can also demonstrate any of the equipment that we have in our inventory. If you're able to come to us in our office at the University of Washington campus, we can do an in-person demonstration. Otherwise, we're happy to schedule one over Zoom. You can also contact us to learn more about AT resources in our state. And if you have any general questions about AT, um, you can reach us and we can help share resources or other information. This is a screenshot of our uh, lending portal. Um, you can reach it by going to our website and you can look up um, any kind of AT that we have either under device category. Uh, right now it's keyboards that's been selected and you can see a number of the keyboards available. Otherwise, if you know what specifically you're looking for, you can look, you can search under device name. Our loan period is three to five weeks. Um, generally, we can extend to five weeks unless the item is in high demand. If you notice that the device that you want to borrow is out, you can add yourself to the wait list here. There is a small administrative fee. Depending on the device, it can be anywhere from $10 to $50, and that's really to cover shipping and insurance costs. We do partner with some programs. Uh, if your client is participating in vocational rehabilitation through uh, the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation or the Department of Services for the Blind, um, they, we have a relationship with them, a contract with them. So the administrative fee would be paid by them. We partner with the Northwest Access Fund for alternative financing. They specialize in providing uh, assistive technology specific loans. So anything from vehicle or home modifications to braille displays, you know, AAC devices, et cetera. Um, they also uh, work well with individuals who are on a fixed income or fixed budget. Uh, they offer financial coaching, so if someone doesn't have any credit history, uh, they, can, they can work with them on building that credit history. Currently, I believe their uh, loan rate is at 5%. The Evergreen Reuse Coalition is a statewide network 
of agencies and organizations involved in reuse activities. Uh, if you go to the link here, and uh, Sue, will, Sue will provide a copy of this PowerPoint if you're interested. But um, at this website, you can find all the partners across the state who are engaged in reuse activities. A lot of the equipment is durable medical equipment, but there's also refurbished hearing aids and amplification devices from the Hearing, Speech, and Deaf Center in Seattle. And then there's other organizations that also um, have video magnifiers available. The I Can Connect program is a program for individuals with combined hearing and vision loss. Um, to, support, to support their access to distance communication. So this program is funded by the FCC and we in Washington State manage it um, in partnership with the Perkins School for the Blind in, uh, in Massachusetts. Um, and we can provide a pretty extensive array of equipment for individuals to access tasks, distance communication tasks, such as email, phone calls, video calls, uh, text messaging, social media. So any of the equipment, computers, laptops, iPads, iPhones, tablets, and the, the assistive technology that they would use to access those devices like braille display, screen readers, magnification software, signalers, um, et cetera. Those can all be provided through this program. And we can also provide um, a significant amount of trainings, up to 30 hours of training to help, a device, or help an individual learn how to use this equipment. So if you have anyone who has, um, who you think might qualify the pro for the program, please feel free to contact us. So when we're talking about vision loss, um, I wanna just share some basic information. Um, about 25.5 million American adults, 18 and older, so that's about 10% of the population, report vision loss according to a 2016 National Health Interview Survey. 81% um, of individuals who have significant vision loss are 50 years and above, so clearly this is uh, more prevalent amongst older Americans. And then according to the 2017 American uh, Community Survey, there are about over 500,000 children with vision difficulty in the US. Some basic vision terminology that you are likely already familiar with is visual acuity, so 2020 is normal vision, and this is defined as um, at 20 feet, you are able to read a certain line of text. So, you know, we've all had our, had our eyes examined and we have the big chart with the E, and so depending on the line that you can read at 20 feet, um, it determines your visual acuity or measures your visual acuity. So as the bottom number gets bigger, that means you need larger text um, in order to read at 20 feet. So 2200 um, is the acuity for legal blindness. For visual fields, um, many eye conditions can impact an individual's visual field. Some conditions leave an individual with only central vision and um, deteriorating central vision, whereas others have no central vision or poor central vision and have to rely on peripheral vision to see. Uh, photophobia uh, is sensitivity to light. Again, many eye conditions um, uh, make people very sensitive to light. Uh, which can impact their ability to see. So the definition again of legal blindness, the acuity is 2200 or less. And then the visual field of 20 degrees or less is also considered legal, legally blind. So you can have 2020 vision, but if your visual field is 20 degrees or less, uh, you're also considered legally blind. 
There are a number of common eye disorders. Um, you've probably heard of many of these, macular degeneration, glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy. And, you know, if you're working with a student or a client who needs accommodation or assistive technology supports, I think it is helpful to find out more about their eye condition so that you get a sense of what their vision is like. Um, for example, someone with Stargardt, their central vision is going to be impacted, so they're going to rely more on their peripheral vision, whereas the opposite is true for someone with retinitis pigmentosa. Um, they, you know, they have central vision only with a diminishing uh, peripheral vision. So for today, we're going to talk about and I will demonstrate some AT solutions in the following categories. I wanna stress here that, you know, I am talking about the technology itself, but um, when we consider um, providing AT, um, we really wanna focus on the tasks that an individual needs to accomplish, not just the technology itself. So um, these are solutions in these categories that can help individuals accomplish uh, specific tasks. So we'll talk about AT for glare reduction, lighting and contrast, video magnifiers and OCR, which is optical character recognition, magnification and screen reading software, braille displays and tactile graphics, apps and wearables. So brightness and glare can be a significant issue for individuals depending on their eye condition. And, you know, there's the option of either having uh, individual accommodations to control for these factors or an environmental um, solution. So in these photos, I have pictured here three uh, young boys who are wearing uh, these glare glasses or glare shields of different colors, um, yellow and orange uh, in this photo. And that's used for uh, contrast. Um, someone who needs more brightness reduction might opt for a plum or an amber frame. So it's a good idea if someone's having issues with contrast or um, glare and brightness to try out some different options to see what might work best. A low vision specialist can also evaluate this and try out a bunch of uh, glare glasses with them. Another easy accommodation to, um, to counteract the overhead brightness is a cap baseball hat with a rim and uh, depending on the environment, this might not always be an acceptable option, but certainly for a student in school, it seems uh, like it could be a good accommodation that also doesn't stand out as something that's dramatically different. Um, for an office environment, um, having glare um, blinds or light filtering blinds is very helpful. You know, the goal isn't to completely eliminate the light. We want to be able just to reduce the amount of light or control the light. And many of the blinds out there now um, are sold by um, percentage of sheerness. So you can have something that is 100% light blocking or, you know, or a range um, anywhere from 10 to 75%. Um, and then this final picture here in the bottom right corner is a cube shield. This is for environments where you can't control um, the overhead lighting for an individual. Um, if the fluorescent lighting or overhead lighting is bothering them, um, putting something like a cube shield to over the workstation area, um, can be an effective solution. So Bose released these Bose frames, which um, are really popular with the blind and low vision community. They range from 150 to 250. <clears throat> and 
you know, as we all know, students are very particular about standing out or wearing things that look strange or odd. And so these bows frames come in different styles and they're, you know, they're cool looking. They, they look like there's a sports um, kind of version. Um, and then there's more of a traditional, what I would call a Ray-Ban style glass. Um, but the cool thing is that these glasses also have what Bose calls their open audio design. So they actually have speakers built into, um, into the frames so that an individual who's wearing the glasses can also, you know, listen to music or uh, listen to a screen reader providing um, navigation information, for example, or um, listen to a voice or a phone call, so on and so forth. They also um, are available with different lenses. So you can actually use a light, I mean, a yellow um, contrast increasing lens or something that's darker um, that would prevent, um, that would compensate for brightness. And the lenses can also be swapped out. So lighting is also an important consideration. While most people don't like an overhead light because that can create glare on the workstation surface, having um, flexible, positionable lighting is really important. I have pictured here a couple of tasks, task lamps. This is on the left is a desk clamped arm that has a lot of flexibility um, and range of motion. I have one clamped to my desk that I got at Ikea for, I don't know, $10 or something like that. And it works really well um, for illuminating my workstation. Um, also, there's another kind of a stand light that is battery charge so that you can move it. It kind of folds into place and it's really effective for just some spot reading or spotlighting on a work surface. There's a woman reading a newspaper with her cup of coffee pictured in this one. So another consideration with lighting is the color of the light. I think we all have heard that, you know, the blue light from screens can be, um, can cause eye strain and you know keep us up at night if we're looking at our devices in bed. Um, so having the ability to choose the temperature of light is very important. Depending on certain eye conditions, people might prefer a brighter, whiter light, um, whereas other folks would prefer something that is a warmer, dimmer color. A great way. Um, to support this need is to use a smart bulb. Uh, there's tons of different options available. I have pictured here the Philips um, Smart Wi-Fi LED. It's full, it has a full color spectrum, you know, from warm to cool, and you can manage it um, with an app or with, you know, an Alexa device or another smart speaker. Contrast is also really important, especially when we're looking at our devices. Um, so most operating systems have a way to change the contrast in the settings. Um, I did recently discover that in Windows, you know, traditionally the way to change the contrast was to go into the ease of access center and then high contrast settings, and then you get the options that are pictured to the right here, um, which are high contrast black and high contrast white. And people always comment that they don't like that it really changes the theme of the display. Um, someone compared it to Windows 95. So another option that Windows recently released is to change the contrast in color filters. Now, if you go into the Ease of Access Center and color filters, you can actually do a reverse um, color, which essentially just changes the color light 
text and background into black and the black text into white, but keeps the look of, um, of your screen or of your applications. Um, Mac and Chromebook both have accessibility, um, both have contrast settings you can find in their accessibility settings. Okay, so moving on to video magnifiers. Video magnifiers or CCTVs um, are essentially devices that have built in cameras that allow you to manipulate to enlarge, uh, en enlarge text or um, change the contract, contrast on printed materials. And they come in a whole bunch of different shapes and sizes. Generally speaking, the smaller devices like the Freedom Scientific Ruby HD pictured here, um, that's kind of a handheld device that I would you know, it's great for spot checking or spot reading things, um, but not something that you would use typically for a textbook. You know, something like that can cost on the low end of the spectrum. Um, I think it's around three or four hundred dollars versus, you know, some of the more uh, complicated high functioning devices that include features like uh, optical character recognition are going to be upwards of $4,000. So there's also the LVI MagnaLink Zip pictured here, which is a standard desktop CCTV. <clears throat> and it's great for um, accessing a lot of printed material, or if a student needs to complete a handwritten assignment, this is something that they can easily use because they can fit the pen under uh, the camera and see what they're writing. There's also a device, um, devices that are made specifically with students in mind, like the Enhanced Vision Transformer. This device is a camera that's on an arm and the camera can be pointed down to read text. It also has that OCR text-to-speech functionality built into it. But the camera can also rotate for distance viewing so the student can access um, the whiteboard or the electronic smartboard as well. Um, I know SETC in their lending library has a number of these uh, CCTVs available. Um, at WATAP, we do have this Enhanced Vision Transformer available to borrow and try out with your student as well. Uh, this is another device, the APH Mac Connect, and the price range is anywhere from $3,000 to $5,000 plus. And really, this is uh, meant to be kind of an all-in-one solution for a low vision student. It has a distance viewing camera to see the board, um, but it's built um, on an Android tablet base. So the Android tablet and the camera built into it also does kind of the desktop video magnification. Because it's an Android device, it also comes with a number of uh, apps. You can download uh, apps from the Play Store. Um, and it also has the Google suite of apps, uh, Dropbox and eBook readers pre-installed. It's also um, has built-in OCR text-to-speech um, and it is available through text or Setsy to borrow. Um, they have a number of them available. So for students who um, can't read a significant amount of text, visually optical character recognition is going to be a solution for accessing, accessing printed materials. So there's a couple ways to go about this. Um, one would be a software solution. So Abbey Fine Reader PDF version is available on PC and Mac for an annual subscription. And it does an excellent job of converting uh, PDF documents or scanned images, even images taken with a camera on a phone um, into, you can convert it into Word, you can convert it into general text. Um, 
they do have an app for Android and iPhone as well. Um, the other option is going to be to use a hardware solution. And there, again, are a number of options available on the market today. I want to show you the OrCam Read, which is $2,000. Uh, it's a relatively new device that we have in our lending program. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the share. And I'm going to stop my overhead video so it doesn't interfere with the camera that I'll be sharing with you. Okay, so I am sharing my document camera window. I hope you can all see that. And I have this device here, which is called the OrCam Read. It's really small. It's probably, let's see here, it's about four inches long, very lightweight, and very simple. Um, Essentially, you have a USB-C charging port. Sorry, I'm trying to get this in view. And then uh, this is the power button. Battery is 94% charged. And then I have maximum. volume up and down, which is plus and minus. And then the image or the printed text capture button here. So if I put this magazine article in view, now I have two options for taking a picture. Um, as I'm holding down the target button, I think you can see that there's a red LED pointer. I can point that at the text I want to capture and then go ahead and take a picture and it will read. The other option is to put it in frame mode. And this creates an LED frame. So if you have multiple columns like we do here and a significant amount of text with a wide angle, um, I can put it in that mode so it recognizes the columns and captures all the text. All at the Battle of the Pinterest Boards. After we got this land, we went off and made our own Pinterest boards and then showed them to each other, says Joseph Altusra, the acclaimed Paris born, New York based fashion designer. Okay. And so it just instantly reads um, all the recognition is built into the device. Um, the only thing is that it doesn't store any of the captured scans. So it's really just a point and read device for immediate access to text. You, it has Bluetooth, so you can connect it to a Bluetooth device um, so that not everyone can hear. You, can't, you don't have to announce all of the speech. Um, and in some situations, there are some employers that you know, don't want you to capture any of any of the sensitive documents or materials that you use. It works well on signs outside, a variety of different um, items. Um, you can even capture text on your computer screen or your iPhone screen. Any questions about the device before I move on? Okay, so I'm gonna go back to my slideshow. Okay, so for magnification and screen reader access, you know, anytime you're considering magnification for an individual, it's also important to consider a monitor or screen size. Uh, generally speaking, the larger the monitor, the less magnification um, is required. I almost always 
recommend an arm to go with a monitor. Um, I have pictured here the Ergotron LX arm, which is one of my favorites. Um, it's really important uh, for individuals to be able to access their screen in an ergonomic matter, manner. And many of our uh, low vision folks need a closer focal distance, or sometimes if they're using eccentric viewing, um, you know, using their peripheral vision or, you know, perhaps a small hole of vision that they have in their visual field, um, being able to position the monitor in the most ergonomic and appropriate place for vision or for viewing is um, really important. Um, you also want to consider that too large of a monitor can um, actually be a negative for individuals who have reduced fields. So someone with retinitis pigmentosa who only has a narrow field of central vision, um, you know, has that much more area to search in a large monitor and um, it might not be the most appropriate accommodation for them. Screen magnification. Um, screen magnification, for the most part, the built-in uh, magnification products are, are pretty good. Um, I would say in Chromebook, um, Android, and iOS and macOS, they are really the only options out there. Um, for PCs, there are a number of options. Uh, Microsoft Man Magnifier is the free option that comes in Windows. Uh, Zoom Text Magnifier and or Reader for PC. Um, and Dolphin Supernova Magnifier Reader for PC are a couple of other um, third-party options available for uh, a Windows computer. Um, Microsoft Magnifier has um, released some updates. Um, I find that many individuals who have low vision, who rely on magnification, still need some screen reading support. Um, and this is often because they experience eye fatigue as they're using um, their vision. And so offsetting that, uh, the use of their vision by providing some kind of screen reader um, for long um, or lengthy amounts of text is very helpful. In the past, uh, you know, Zoom text and Dolphin Supernova both offer good options for screen reading support in conjunction with magnification that's not the full-fledged screen reader that is usually too uh, verbose and, and complicated for individuals who have low vision. Um, Magnifier, Microsoft didn't have an option available, but now they have included some speech support. So I'm gonna go ahead and share that with you. So you should all be able to see this Word document. And I'm just going to type in magnifier, my search bar, and bring that up. So now in the center of my, um, of my Word document is the magnifier bar. Um, I can increase the magnification. Okay hope that you can see that as well. And this is kind of standard um, what's been available with the magnifier, but they've also added some speech support. So now there is an icon uh, with a pointer and an audio speaker symbol um, that I can click and read. Um, I also get a tool tip here. I can do control alt and left mouse click in order to click in a specific part of the of the text. So let's try that. Go control Alt, clicking my left pointer at the beginning. The Washington Assistive Technology Act program, WATOP, provides resources and services to persons who face challenges related to disability and aging to help in the selection and use of assistive. All right. 
So it also provides a nice visual frame that I can see as the text is, as it's reading across the text. So it's a nice, simple solution that should be built into all the Windows 10 and 11 machines out there. Okay. So again, when we're considering magnification for an individual, once someone reaches eight to 10 X magnification, and you, know, you can tell with the access on uh, the device that it's slow and not efficient, um, it might be time to add in a full screen reader, especially if an individual has an eye condition that is progressive. So for screen re readers, you know, they are very verbose. They're keyboard driven. So there are a lot of keystrokes that an individual has to learn. And you actually hear a lot of computer technology, tech babble, you know, vocabulary that um, a typical user might might not understand or know the meaning of. And so certainly a screen reader um, is going to require some training for an individual to use effectively. Screen readers also run uh, the braille displays. So if someone is using a braille display, they need to also have a screen reader um, running as well. So again, Mac, OS, iOS, Android, and Chromebox all have built-in screen readers and they're essentially the only options. Uh, the Mac OS and iOS screen readers are, are very good. Um, I think that they can support the needs of most users out there. For Windows machines, um, JAWS for Windows by Freedom Scientific is still um, the most popular screen reader out there. Um, I think it generally has good support for, for a lot of um, applications. Uh, Supernova screen reader is another option made by Dolphin, and they're big in Europe. They're based out of the UK, and um, they have more users of that software in Europe. NVDA is also a free option for the PC, and there are situations where, you know, JAWS may not do a great job of reading uh, certain applications and NVA does better. So most of the individuals I know who are screen reader users, you know, who are working in an environment where they're accessing computers frequently use uh, a combination of screen readers, typically JAWS and NVDA. All right, so moving on to Braille and tactile graphics. You know, Braille is really important for uh, blind students in terms of learning literacy. Uh, Braille is a representation of, um, of characters. And, you know, with a screen reader, you're not really learning how to spell anything or how, how anything is spelled. Um, whereas with Braille, um, you still have to read uh, the braille and kind of learn how to learn your phonics and learn how to spell um, spell words. Another benefit of braille is that there's no audio needed. You can mute a screen reader and just navigate a device with uh, the braille display. It also provides spatial information about the layout of your screen. So for example, you know, if you're in a Word document, um, and uh, there is the text starts, you know, five spaces in, that is going to be reflected on the Braille display. So a user would know that um, by reading the Braille versus um, if someone's just listening to a screen reader, they have to ask the screen reader for that information um, and may not, may not realize that there's, some of that formatting difference. Um, editing documents is great because you can jump to the specific location where you might find spelling error and correct it really quickly. 
Uh, Nemeth code is uh, the math braille and it's um, an option for students who need to read math problems. There's also braille code for music. So there are a number of refreshable braille displays on the market. Um, and there's many sizes, anywhere from 14 to 80 cells. And each cell is essentially one character. Um, so the standard um, is 40 cells um, for working students. Um, 14 cells, some people use 14 smaller displays for portability if they're um, wanting a braille display to use maybe with their iPhone. Um, and then you can also connect them through Bluetooth and USB connections. Um, there's a wide range of prices, anywhere from $695 to $6,000. And again, that really depends on um, how big the display is and how many features are available. The APH Mantis Braille display that I have here um, is a 40 cell display and it is the only display that I'm aware of that has a QWERTY keyboard built into it. So many other Braille displays uh, for inputting into their device, you know, if you wanted to respond to an email or something, um, actually use the Perkins Braille keys, um, which, you know, depending on an individual's use of Braille when they learned Braille um, is not always the most efficient um, way of inputting text. And so having a Braille display that has a keyboard option is really huge. Um, and this uh, Braille, uh, the APH, APH Mantis, I think is about $2,000. And there might even be less expensive options specifically for schools. Um, the APH also has a chameleon. This is a 20 cell braille display. And this is a great device for students who are learning braille. Um, it has, you know, note taker editor built into it. So you can read, you know, uh, word files, Braille files um, by transferring it into onto an SD card in this device. It has 20 refreshable Braille cells and you know other features like calculator, clock, file management, etc. Don't know the pricing on this exactly, but I think it's somewhere around $1,200. Uh, tactile graphics are a great tool for learning um, for students. On the left here, I have a Braille printed US map. So this is printed uh, using a graphical, a graphics Braille embosser. Um, and it's a, kind of a raised line map of Texas with different cities. Um, marked in Braille. Um, there's some information about topography. I think these might be rivers that are these thin kind of dotted lines and then also some raised areas um, of textures, um, which would probably be mountains. So another form of tactile graphics are 3D printers. Um, they can be used to print um, all kinds of different, or all kinds of different um, shapes and you know informational um, informational uh, 3D uh, output. So this is a 3D printed U.S. map, and what I think is really cool is that the height or the thickness of the state is different depending on population. So you can see California is really tall and so is New York, Texas. And then we have Washington, which 
you know, has some <clears throat> height to it, but it's certainly not one of the most populous states. So um, having that three-dimensional option can, you know, it's great to be able to confer meaning other than just, you know, the size and the shape of, uh, of a state. Moving on to apps. Um, for text-to-speech, there are a couple different options. Actually, there are a number of different options for apps, but a couple of the popular ones, um, the KNFB Reader uh, was renamed the One Step Reader. It's pictured on the left, and it is for iOS, Android, Windows, um, and it's $99. So you use the camera on your device in order to take a picture of text and have it read to you. Seeing AI is made by Microsoft and it's free, um, but only available on iOS. So I'm gonna go ahead, ahead and uh, share my screen here so you can see. How it works. So across the bottom, seat zero. Field PRTSCN SCRLK F12 pause backspace enter O shift K insert L. Okay, so across the bottom of the screen um, is the different options, the menu options. I can do instant text where I am right now. I can choose to scan a document. I can do a barcode reader. I can do facial um, or person recognition or identification, a bill identifier, landscape, colors, handwriting. So this device actually does an excellent job with handwriting. So let's go ahead and try that option. There aren't handwriting um, preview. There aren't many um, options for handwriting recognition. So we'll see how it does with my. And processing 9 10 11 12 13 14 hello my name is naomi okay so i got some of the text on this ruler board that i have behind the image but it did read hello my name is naomi quite well um instant text works really short well. text is I can uh, just point my camera. Sugar zero lemon lime zero comma zero lemon lime. At um, a Gatorade bottle and it was reading to me. My mom who is blind uses this for her spices and all kinds of things in our kitchen that she can't identify by shape. I else contains no nutrition facts. Serving size one bottle CN. I L Q W Alt Mod Cute Express. So for anyone who has um, an iPhone or an iPad, this is an excellent um, option uh, for OCR and text access. If you actually take a picture and scan text, um, you can export it into uh, your email uh, so that you can manipulate it on a different device. So another type uh, of app that is available, available out there are apps with visual assistance or that connect, connect you to visual assistance. Um, Ira is a paid option. Um, and then Be My Eyes is a free option. Really, the difference is that um, with the paid option, you actually have visual navigators who are uh, employed by IRA and have been trained to provide um, 
some visual navigation information to blind individuals. <clears throat> I've heard of, um, you know, it's an excellent tool for traveling in your community or in a new place independently. Um, one of my former coworkers was telling me she was using it to go to a meeting in a building downtown where, you know, it's a skyscraper. There's multiple banks of elevators depending on the floor you need to go to. And so she was able to navigate to the right floor and the right office uh, independently uh, with Ira's visual assistant. I've heard of other people, you know, running marathons or triathlons with Ira. Um, another person I know is a single. Um, blind man who lives alone and he uses Ira to get help with online shopping for clothes. Apparently Googling or searching for a green sweater on Amazon, you know, doesn't really give you a lot of information of what that actually looks like. So, you know, it can be used in many different um, scenarios um, and for many different um, lengths of time. So the subscription service is based on how many minutes you're using it for. Um, IRA is free in some locations. So I know at the SeaTac airport, you can, if you have the app on your device, you can actually connect to an agent for free there to navigate the airport independently. It's also available in Starbucks locations so that you can, um, you know, order your coffee and navigate um, to the right um, counters to get your coffee. Be My Eyes essentially uh, provides the same service, but it uses volunteers. So when you connect um, online uh, through the app, um, it pairs you with a volunteer that accepts the task and helps you. So I think it's great um, for general assistance in this image here, there's a woman reading the back of the box. But you know, if you're looking at more private information like medical documentation or, you know, financial information, then um, having a free volunteer may not be the best option. Uh, Microsoft Soundscape is an app for iOS only, and it is free. And what's cool about this um, it's a navigation app, but it uses what's called 3D sound or 3D audio navigation. So it does require that you have in um, headphones or, you know, stereo headphones of some sort. And it actually gives you directional information um, through sound. So if you are looking for a point of interest and it is on your right side, you're going to hear the sound of that location announced in your right ear um, so that you can turn and navigate in the right direction. Um, there are, uh, Microsoft has partnered with certain headphone manufacturers, you know, the Bose um, audio glasses um, and Sony has some earbuds as well that um, they partner with. So the earbuds and the glasses do some tracking as well to provide you with more precise information um, in terms of navigating um, by sound to where you need to go. Wearables right now are um, really popular. There's many of them on the market these days. The OrCam Pro is basically a glass, eyeglass mounted camera version of the OrCam Read that I demonstrated earlier. Um, but, you know, it does read printed materials, this money identification, facial recognition. Um, it's 4250. Um, and again, it has the same limitations, but it does not store any of the information captured. Um, Onyx by Oxite is $2,000, and it's a new wearable out of the UK. And it is specifically for individuals who have central vision loss. So, you know, someone maybe with Star Guards or 
uh, macular degeneration. It uses AI to adapt to your vision. So the lenses project video to the usable area of your vision um, rather than just a general screen itself. Vision Buddy is another wearable device that has a lot of accessories to go with it. Um, it's kind of a closed system, similar to a VR system. Um, and you can connect a video um, magnifier to it for um, you know, access to printed materials. You can also connect it with an HDMI connection to you know, a gaming system or your TV or streaming service. Envision glasses are another wearable option. It's 3,500 and this is based on the Google Glass. Um, it does text and handwriting recognition, describes the scene, kind of explores your, um, your environment. You can search for specific objects and it will um, make a chime when it finds that object in the field of vision for the glasses. Um, you can also set it up so you can call an ally or a buddy to help you in an emergency situation. The drawback here is that it requires Wi-Fi. So if you're out and about with it, you do need to tether it to your um, smartphone in order to use it effectively. Uh, finally, the Sunu band is a wearable um, band that goes on your wrist and it's uses sonar in addition to a cane to provide some information about your environment. So um, the cane is really excellent at detecting um, obstacles, you know, down on the ground near your feet at a certain height. Uh, but the Sunu van um, is made to detect obstacles that are above your knees to your head. Um, so that, you know, you don't accidentally run into a pole or an overhang or something like that. There are a number of resources um, I've put on this slide. And again, if you get a copy of the PDF from Sue, um, you can review those. And this is the contact information for WhatsApp.